Good evening, and I'd like to welcome everybody to our last informational session for the uh, special election that's going to be held on November 7th for a uh, question around an operating levy. Uh, tonight's meeting is kind of twofold. We want to provide a context around uh, the district's financial reality. We want to talk, and then we want to talk about and share what, what the question is and what it entails so people have a good understanding about what they're voting around when they vote on November 7th. So you, you may or may not be familiar, but over the past three years, the district has faced uh, a budget deficit each of those three fiscal years. Over that time, we've cut and reduced and realigned about $4.1 million. And as you can see on the graphic behind me, uh, it's been layered in. So $700,000 in 21-22, about a million dollars in 22-23, and then last year, almost $2.4 million. Um, and, and for us, we knew that we were gonna be in a situation from a district standpoint um, to probably have to look at asking and going out to our voters for some additional revenue prior to the expiration of our current operational levy, which was uh, approved in 2015 and runs through 2025. Um, we felt that we were gonna be at a point where we're gonna continue to make reductions and the school board really wanted to give our community an opportunity to kind of have a decision, be part of that decision-making process and have the opportunity to say, do we, do we add in additional revenue at this time or do we continue down that, that process? So I know sometimes people you know, may not notice or may not hear when you're not reducing programs, when you're not reducing uh, other forward-facing things, but we have been in that, that budget reduction process over the, the past three years. What does that look like? Uh, probably the, the two biggest things that our community has noticed over that period of time was some of the reductions that we made in 22-23. The first one was to increase our staffing ratio by one, which effectively increases class size. We were very fortunate after the levy, in, uh, the levy passed in 2015 to take our current staffing um, policy and decrease that ratio by one up until 22-23. Then we had, as one of our budget reductions and alignments, we, we put it back to what it was in policy, um, which effectively raised that ratio by one, increasing, increasing class size. The other thing that people may have noticed along uh, during that same time was a realignment and a reorganization of, uh, of our pullout gifted and talented program. Some of the things that have taken place in our district in terms of realignment and, and reduction that a lot of people don't see because there's this concept that um, try to keep reductions as far away from the classroom as possible, are reductions that have taken place in other areas of our district. So in the past 10 years, you can see that we've reduced our district-wide support by almost nine FTE. That's director level positions, HR finance, technology, teaching and learning. At the same time, uh, we also reduced our administrative assistance positions. We reduced three of those one at um, each of our secondary buildings, so one at each middle school and one at the high school. The remaining administrative, assistance, uh, administrative assistants also saw a reduction of their hours as well. And then another group that was impacted by reductions over the past 10 years was our custodial group, and we reduced um, that staff by five FTE. A lot of times when we enter these conversations, uh, people will ask me, well, well, why don't you cut other things other than the classroom. Keep those cuts as far away from the classroom as possible. And the reality is everything that we have listed here in terms of district-wide support, admin support, and our custodial support, those reductions do impact our classroom and impact the daily um, workload of our teachers and our staff. Um, when, there's, when, when there's less people to provide those supports, um, it, the work remains. It just gets pushed down to other people. So if we have, if we have, we have less people in um, HR and finance, that means our office staff in the buildings have to do more. We have less custodial staff, that means they're not able to, to clean in the same amount of time, have to do more work. So we ask our teachers to do additional things prior to, to leaving the building. Now, uh, at, during the same time that we've been making these reductions and try to align structurally to, to our revenue, um, which has led to those reductions, we've also tried to be very strategic um, with the money that has been given to us from our taxpayers. As I shared before, we were very fortunate in 2015 to get an operating levy, which generates about $5 million per year to our general fund. 
And for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, school finance, general fund is kind of our main bucket of money that we can use for, for anything. In 2015, there was a second question on the ballot that the voters also approved, and that was for a bond. When you think of bonds, typically those go for building, capital expenses, and things like that. The approval of that $45 million bond, $45 million bond was really for, for two things initially. Um, at that time, the state of Minnesota, or just prior to that, the state of Minnesota only funded kindergartners at a .5, which meant most districts had half-day kindergarten. They decided to make that change, make it a, into a 1.0 funded uh, per pupil unit, which meant we could then offer all-day kindergarten. The problem with a lot of the things the state does, they don't think about the impact and spacing needs of that. You know, it, when, when you have half day, you can actually serve twice the, twice the amount of students in the same space because you're bringing them in shifts. So like us and a lot of districts across the state, to be, to be able to have room for those all day kindergartens that were going to come in, we need to build additional classrooms on each of our elementaries. So we use part of that $45 million bond to do that. The other thing we need to do is to do some significant security upgrades across our buildings and make sure that we have secure entrances into each of those things. And again, going into that election and into that vote, those were the two primary things that we wanted to be able to do. Through some strategic partnerships with our um, architects, um, our construction, um, our vendors and things like that, we were able to stretch that $45 million well beyond those uh, two initial projects and actually got through almost four and a half phases. We, did, we were able to take, take care of some um, facility needs that if we weren't able to use that money, we'd either have to use general fund dollars for or come back to and ask our voters to provide additional bond money for that deferred maintenance. Big ticket things like a new boiler at Aiken Road before uh, it needed to be replaced. Uh, two new roofs on buildings, Aiken Road and Meadowview. If you've been out here at the, at, at the high school, either when we're dropping kids off at the beginning of the day or picking them up at the end of the day or after a big event, you know that exiting this place can be problematic. We were fortunate to partner with the city of Lakeville and the city of Farmington to actually create the extension of 202nd Street, which leaves uh, kind of the north part of the property out here and then exits uh, west to um, Cedar, which actually right now with the closure at Flagstaff and Highway 50 is, is, is been a, a lifesaver for us getting people in and out of this building. We were able to upgrade the TLLC, which is the old middle school or the old high school for some people in downtown Farmington. And what we were able to do with that is bring that up to um, kind of the same level of the rest of the buildings in our district. And it serves a, a very unique purpose um, for our community. First of all, it's in downtown Farmington where there isn't a lot of space. And it, it serves a lot of our community ed programs and early, ch early childhood special ed as well. Uh, we were able to do some parking lot reconfiguration and then also um, upgrade North Trails fire alarms. So we feel like um, it, it, it's hard to put a price take exactly what that saved our taxpayers. All we know is there's some significant things that we will not have to worry about or take care of from a deferred maintenance cost in the near future. On the other end of things, um, we were able to also save our taxpayers money in terms of, of what we needed to collect to them to pay off some of our bonds. Just like your house, when you, when you buy a house, you go out and you get a mortgage. We grew fast. And when you build buildings, you go out and you, um, you, you basically you bond for those. And as part of the bonds, there's an interest rate. And just like your house, if you're strategic with your mortgage, you're taking a look at those interest rates and you're trying to decide, is now a good time to maybe refinance and save money on the interest that you're paying? Your principal stays the same, but you save that money on the interest. The same thing for us. We've been really fortunate to partner with Ellers, who's our, our financial advisor, who looks at the bond market and comes to us and says, hey, we think this is a good time to go out and, and refund those bonds, which is just like refinancing. Since 2011, through that refunding process, we've saved our taxpayers over $26 million. Now that doesn't mean the district gets $26 million in additional revenue. It just means that we need to collect $26 million or less from our taxpayers, again, lowering the tax impact um, throughout our community. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about some other impacts uh, on the district financially. Um, most of you have heard 
um, about the 2023 legislature session, whether it's from legislators or the governor, about all these historic things that they did for school. And the reality is they're historic on a lot of levels, but not the levels that they're talking about. They're historic um, from the perspective of the number of, of laws that have been passed that impact schools, and also historic on the new either unfunded or not totally funded mandates that the district needs to deal with. So for us, one of the things that they did do is they raised our, our, they increased our per pupil funding, which is what every district gets. It's kind of the main funding source. And every district gets the same per pupil funding amount. You can kind of around $8,000-ish around that. It gives you a ballpark. They gave us a 4% increase on that. The previous 12 years, it had been 2%. And for the rhetoric that we heard, that 4% is historic. I'm going to put that in perspective for you in a second. So you can see on the slide that I have here a number of the new mandates that, that we are looking at and that we are going to be responsible for. They're all very well intended, but they all come with uh, relatively hefty price tags. Some have limited funding, one-time funding, or funding until it runs out, and others have no funding at all. Um, the READ Act. The READ Act is a really good piece of legislation that's going to kind of bring all the schools in the state of Minnesota under one umbrella in terms of how we um, instruct and teach literacy. Sorely needed. One of the problems is it has limited funding. We are going to have to train all of our staff in, in one of two different um, teaching methodologies. So we have to train almost 300 people. Uh, by July 1st of 2025, and then we have another round. So there's going to be a cost for training. And that's not only going to be the training, but also internal trainers. So we're talking about training and people. We're going to have to purchase new resources, new screeners, new diagnostic tools. Um, and, and, and so the cost for those things are going to be significant. When we started this process, we estimated about $400,000 per year in, in, in probably the next, you know, for the next four to six years. But as we've gotten more information from the state, it looks like that's going to be closer to $600,000, if not more. Now, just to put that into perspective, the 4% that we got from the state for our district, 1% is $500,000. So if we say that the REDAC is going to cost us about $600,000, now we went from 4%, now we got 3% from the state. MTS, multi, MTSS, multi-tiered system of supports, right? That, that is how do we provide uh, additional assistance for students that need it, specifically around literacy and math, um, when they begin to fall behind. Uh, we're going to have to come up to speed with that as well. We do have interventionists in place in our elementary buildings, but we probably need one more in each of our elementary buildings. That's five additional interventionists, and currently don't have any interventionists in our secondary building. We are going to have to come into compliance with that. Um, there's no timeline set for that, but we know that in, in some relatively um, short period of time, we're going to have to add additional people and resources around those things. Unemployment insurance, again, well intended. They opened up the door for the people in our district that are eligible for that. That's a district cost. Um, they also opened that up for people that we contract with. And just like any other contract that we have, um, the people that, that have that contract, they have to pay that cost, but that cost gets pushed down to us. So we know that that's going to be significant. Um, paid family medical leave, again, another well-intended, going to give a number of people across the state um, access to time off to do different things that they may not have had before. That's paid through a payroll tax, 0.7%. Uh, we split that. We pay half of it. The employees pay half of it. Our half of the 0.7% is $200,000. But again, when we look at our system compared to other systems, when our employees are gone, they need a substitute. And it's really easy for us to figure out what that cost is going to be because we can go back and look at historical data, see who would have um, qualified for that and what those sub-costs could be. And a conservative estimate is almost $550,000 for that. So again, so if you take the READ Act, which is about $600,000, there goes 1% that, of that 4%. The paid family medical leave, if that's $500,000, that's another 1%. So you've gone from 4%, now you're only at 2%, and that's what the state has funded us uh, you know, for the past 12 years. Nothing historic about that. Paraprofessional training, again, we've, we've done this. Uh, it requires eight hours. We already provide six. 
and then um, safe and sick time, and most of our hourly workers accrue that anyways. So these are conservative estimates, but they are going to impact us, and they're going to impact us for a significant amount of time. The other thing that we do have concerns about is other unfunded mandates that have carried forward. You may have heard of things like the multilingual cross-subsidies, special education cross-subsidies. And what we're talking about there are things that are required of us that the state does not fully fund. Special education is one of those. Um, if a student comes to us with an individual as a learner, learning plan, we are required to provide all those supports um, to them. We can't deny those things. The state uh, was only funding that at about 14%. They've increased that to almost 48%. That still leaves our district uh, cross-subsidy, which means uh, uh, an amount of money that we're paying out of our general fund for things that should be funded of $4 million. And to be quite honest with you, when, when the 2023 legislative session started, we advocated that they take care of all current mandates before they worry about the per-pupil funding or add any other, and clearly they didn't, didn't listen to us in that effect. And, and if they would have taken uh, care of the special ed cross subsidy, we wouldn't be having these meetings and we wouldn't be holding a special election um, looking to revoke and uh, replace our current operating levy. Uh, the other big one is multilingual, and you can see that's about $500,000. And then other things, just like everybody else they see in their own lives, we continue to see those things, subscription costs going up, contract uh, costs going up, um, all of those things and dealing with those types of things that, that we, we, just like everybody else, are trying to figure out how to, to manage those ongoing costs. Finance facts, so that, that kind of gives you a, a brief history. Um, and, and again, one of the reasons that the board uh, made the decision to go out for the special election is looking forward to, to, to the 2024-25 budget, we are projecting another deficit. Um, and that deficit is conservatively projected at, at $3.5 million. Again, everything that we do with school finance is estimates. It, it could be $2 million. It, it's going to be in the ballpark between that. Regardless, if we need to make another round of reductions to, um, to realign that $2 million, we're really out of the other things to reduce and cut. We're talking about having to potentially increase class size again. We're talking about having to look at current schedules that we have in different buildings. We're having to look at experiences that our kids currently have where they might be you know, double booked with a teacher, pull out experiences, experiences that we have outside of, of our buildings where kids go to um, another site to maybe participate in a program and things like that. And we would prefer to keep those because we know once they go away, they're very difficult to bring back. And again, the board felt like this was the appropriate time to give the community that opportunity to, to, to vote and decide what direction that we're going to go in. Just some other finance facts, and again, these are our realities. When we look at our current operating levy, which again, I said, generates about $5 million per year, um, and you know, on this chart it says 552, this is a chart that's a little bit older. Uh, I believe with inflation and things like that, it's now closer to 660 per, per learner. You can see that, that we generate significantly net less revenue than the district surrounding us. Now there's lots of reasons for it. it, it doesn't matter why, but it's important for our community to understand that this is our financial reality. Um, and, and really where it impacts things is when we look at what we're able to actually spend per learner. Um, and it would make sense, right? If you generate less le revenue, bring in less revenue, you're gonna have less money to spend. Go back to the per pupil funding unit. That's the equitable part of state funding. Every district gets the same amount per student. Then there's other buckets that depend on different things that bring in different revenue. And then there's the ability of a community to generate additional revenue through that, through that local operating um, uh, referendum. And that, that significantly impacts what districts are able to spend. So when you look at this graph, what we're able to spend compared to what our neighbor districts are able to spend, it's significant. Our, our closest neighbor is Hastings. Um, they spend about $1,000 more per student than we do. If you want to do some quick math, take 6,800 times 1,000, and that gives you the difference in the amount of money that they're able to spend. And then we look at some of our neighboring, the state average is about 15,000, and then some of our, our other neighboring districts 
have a have a, a, a lot you know greater ability to spend based on the revenue that they they bring in and a lot of times people will ask me and say well why does this district or why does this district have these things that we don't have the the quite simple answer is is we don't generate the same revenue that they generate so again um, there's there's lots of reasons for that I think as a as a as a district we've been tried to we've tried to be very sensitive and understanding of the impact that it has on on potential or on our individual homeowners because of some of the, the lack of business and things that we have in our community um, but those those things do make a difference when we look at different opportunities um, for our learners so what's on the ballot, okay? So the ballot is a single question, and like I said, it's an operating levy. So this money comes directly to the general fund. If it passes, uh, we as a district collect more money from taxpayers, goes in the general fund, and it can be used for, for anything. And this is what we call a revoke and replace. So we would revoke the current levy that's in place and replace it with a higher amount. So I'm not going to use the the per pupil funding, because I think it's easier to think about it in, in dollars generated. So currently we generate $5 million with our operating levy. What this would do is it would revoke the $5 million that we currently generate from that operating levy, and it would replace it with $9 million. Now the $9 million isn't new money, $4 million of it's new. So it's a $4 million increase. So you revoke the $5 million, you replace it with $9 million, okay? And that would generate $9 million for three years. So 24, 25, 25, 26, 26, 27. Then the second part of the question would then infuse another $4 million um, into our general fund. So you would go for from 5 million to nine, nine for three years, and then it would be 13 for the remaining seven years. And I'll explain in a second why that is. We, as I stated before, we grew quickly, all right? And we had bonds to, be, to, to make sure that we could build the buildings for our, our learner population. Well, just like you know, your home, when you pay off your home, you have some additional revenue. We don't generate additional revenue when we pay off our bonds, but it decreases the tax impact on our community. So we are paying off two bonds in the near future, 24, 25, so we have debt falling off then, which will lessen the tax impact. Regardless of what happens with, with, with the operating levy, there's going to be a decrease in that impact because of that bonds paying off. And then we have significant debt falling off in 27, 28. So when you look at the impact of this passing on a average home in Farmington, we used $350,000. I think when the city sent theirs out, it was three hundred thirty, dollars but it's in the ballpark. So for us to generate an additional $4 million for those first three years, an average homeowner, $350,000, if nothing else changed, now just a quick caveat, that the biggest impact on your uh, property taxes is the value of a home, and there's a good thing that we continue to build houses in our district, but that does increase your property value. So you got to kind of uh, keep that in mind when you start to look at your tax statements. But if nothing changed, everything has stayed the same on that $350,000 house, their property taxes would increase $1,325 per month for that first three years. Then when that second infusion, the rest of that $8 million, so the, the, the $8 million total, that second infusion of $4 million kicks in in 27, 28. We have so much debt dropping off that that same homeowner, if everything stayed the same, would actually see a decrease in their property taxes of $14.83 per month for a net decrease of, of $158. So our, our board um, felt the need to ask for additional revenue, but do it in a way that they felt kind of offset the, the tax impact that it, it might have on our community. Here's a, a, and I'll show you where we can get this, but here's just a quick graphic that goes through that same stepped in process of um, you know, revoking the five million, replacing it with nine million for three years, and then um, adding another four million to get to 13 for the remainder of that. Um, here's the, the tax bracket sheet for next year. So this gives estimates of, of where we're at. 
And when you take a look at this, again, this basically walks you through what I just did. So the, the column on the left gives us the, the, the property value. Then the next column on the right says the revoked authority. So you're going to see we're revoking that $5 million. And underneath it, you see a decrease in, in property taxes, right? You revoke it, tax in, in, in impact decreases. Then you see the proposed authority. That would be the $9 million if it's approved. Tax impact goes up. And then you see the next one to the right, reducing, reduction in existing debt, 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 uh, debt levies. Your taxes go down again. And then the far one on the right, net change, you can see the net impact of, of those. So it goes down, goes up, goes down, and the net impact. So again, for a $350,000 uh, house, the net, net impact on a year would be uh, $159, which gets you to $1325. If approved, and all this is, you know, I'd love to be able to, to stand in front of the group tonight and talk about all the cool shiny things that we'd be able to add in. But based on our, our current budget forecast and, and based on the mandates that are rolling in and still not fully funded, what we want to do, especially the first three years of this, if, a, it, if it is approved, is to maintain the current programming that we've had. We've been very fortunate. As I shared before, we've made a number of reductions. We've done a lot to realign in the past 10 years. But for the most part, the programming programs that we've had and the experiences and opportunities that we've had have stayed intact. We also wanted to, the second bullet goes to the man mandate part of things. We want to be able to offset those and stabilize our funding um, throughout the life of this. Voting is open now. Um, actually, absentee voting began on September 22nd. Um, that will transition to direct balloting on October 20th, which is a week from tomorrow. And the only difference between absentee ballot and direct balloting is instead of when you do your ballot of folding it all up and putting it in the multiple envelopes, you put it through your machine. You can do that early voting in four places. You can do it here at the district office at Farmington High School. You can park by the flagpoles, walk in door 16, they'll get you to um, the office to vote or you can do it any of the three Dakota County service centers. So you're talking Apple Valley, Hastings, and West St. Paul. And then election day, we are having four combined lo polling locations. You can find information on our website about where are, where is your polling, your, your combined polling location, but you should have also, or you will be receiving a postcard that identifies that for you as well. And then finally, if, if you have questions, uh, we have a dedicated email address that we're using to kind of be able to answer people in a much more timely fashion. We have a couple people monitoring, so it's referendum at farmington.k12.mn.us. Send in questions, we'll get you information uh, as back um, and turn that around pretty quickly. The other thing we're using that email address for is um, we look at questions that come through, and if we see the same questions kind of over and over and over again, we then add that to our FAQ page on, on our district page. Um, I do want to show you one last thing. So if you, if you go to our homepage, um, you know, uh, www.farmington.k12.mn.us, and you look at the top ribbon, and you go to the far right, you'll see referendum. And underneath that, we have all sorts of information, uh, voting information, tax impact, those charts, FAQs, and fact sheets and things like that. So, appreciate everybody coming out on a rainy night tonight. Hopefully we are able to answer some questions for you, and I'd be more than happy to stick around afterwards and answer any questions. Thank you.